G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here, with part two in Coral Sea Catalinas, my uh, book review or perhaps book reading, coming from Catalina Squadron's first and furthest, recounting the operations of RAAF Catalinas, May 1941 to March 1943 by Jack Riddell. And of course, the date of today, more or less forces us to uh, pay attention to the fact that it's 79 years, more or less, since what was later described by Australia's Governor General, Sir Paul Hasluck, as Australia's Day of National Shame. A thing which he said partly because RAAF personnel, after the bombing of Darwin Airport, were told to disperse into the surrounding bush in order to uh, be safer from the prospect of further Japanese attacks. And some of them took themselves into the uh, surrounding bush to the point where they were told to stop at Daly Waters and go back. Others went to Tennant Creek. Others went to Alice Springs. Um, there were, in fact, RAAF refugees from the bombing of Darwin picked up as far away as Brisbane, Newcastle, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, and Perth. The major reason that the RAAF personnel were inclined to take disperse into the bushes as being a general order to run away on the day was because they knew that there were no RAAF fighter aircraft in Darwin. They actually were aware of the fact that the only modern monoplane fighter with a closed cockpit and a retractable undercarriage was in Melbourne on the day the Japanese bombed Darwin, and that was a Hawker Hurricane which was kept at Point Cook. It had no guns and it was only ever flown for recruiting displays and at air shows, putting on aerobatics demonstrations. The reason there were no modern fighter aircraft ready and prepared to defend Darwin is because Australia's entire World War II defence strategy as regards air power was to function as a recruiting collection training basin to feed reinforcements to the Royal Air Force in Britain. So Australia had squadrons, but they were in Britain. In 1941, as we've already heard from Jack Riddell, that on the outbreak of war in September 1939, Australia was just about to take delivery of a squadron of Sunderland flying boats. And they got to stay in Britain for the duration of the war, hunting submarines in the North Sea and the Atlantic. And our fighter squadrons, the Kitty Hawks, they were all out in the Libyan desert. We had Hudson's and Wirraways at Port Moresby. We had Hudson's and Wirraways at Darwin. We had the Catalinas based kind of out of Rathmines with a main base here in Port Moresby and advanced operational bases all over the Southwest Pacific. That was all more or less for reconnaissance. When it came for try and conclusions against the Japanese, Australia had a squadron of Lockheed Hudson's at Kota Baru. There was some more at Sanji Patani. I think Kuala Lumpur and Singapore might have had Brewster Buffaloes. But that's basically where Australia's fighter force was located at the start of the war. And of course, all that got wiped out as the Japanese cut through 
British Malaysia and the Dutch East Indies like hot knives through butter. By the time the Japanese bombed Darwin, the Australian Army was in retreat on East Timor, I think, as I recall it. Might have already run off and headed for the hills. Um, and the Japanese were seen as being nigh on invincible. And it's not actually very far from Timor to Darwin. So the powers that be looked at Australia and figured that 90% of the population lived over here on the east coast. So they determined that the thing to do to prepare for a projected Japanese invasion of Darwin with tankettes and bicycle brigades was to rule a line neatly from Brisbane to Melbourne. And everything to the east of the Brisbane to Melbourne line was to be energetically defended against the Japanese. Therefore, thus and because, it was assumed that the Japanese were now on the point of invading and that if this happened, they would overrun the defence forces and capture or destroy any reinforcements that were sent north. Darwin, like the West Australian ports that were bombed soon afterwards, was therefore considered expendable. Even the man who had conceived the idea of the Brisbane line, General Sir Ivan Mackay, was still in command of all land forces in Australia at the time of the raid. The Brisbane Line policy was finally abandoned on the 18th of April 1942 when MacArthur became Supreme Commander and by 25th of April there were so many fighter aircraft at Darwin that when a Japanese attack force of 25 bombers and 10 fighters came over, 8 bombers and 4 fighters were shot down. Repositioning the ruler to show the actual slice of real estate which was to be defended. Whoops. There we go. From Brisbane. Where I'm standing here is actually to westward of that line. The tank traps that I have seen on the old Gleninus Grafton Road were put there to defend Grafton and Lismore. As I said, from the Japanese bicycle brigades which were expected to walk overland from Darwin, having invaded Australia from Timor. Again reading from Timothy Hall's Darkest Hour. At Tokum Wall, there we go, we will expand the scale more than a bit. There's Canberra and that's the Murray River there. So Tokum Wall's down there somewhere around Tumbarumba. At Tokum Wall on the Murray River in New South Wales, a three million pound air base was built and that was only ever used for training. After the arrival of MacArthur and without making any contribution to the war effort, it was dismantled and its buildings sent to other air stations all over Australia. The Commonwealth Auditor General was highly critical of the blundering and wasteful expenditure, but what he was never told was that Tokum Wall was built to maintain and service aircraft defending the Brisbane line. What is even more pertinent is that Token Wall had been built for this purpose, not by the previous government, but by Curtin himself, the man who insisted that he had never heard of it and that he would never have countenanced such a treacherous plan. The evidence is irresistible that the Brisbane line strategy by whatever name was very much the key to Australia's defence policy at the time of the Darwin raid. Curtin, after all, had only been in power for 135 days before the raid, and in that time he had built Token Wall. This being the case, there was never any possibility of Darwin being given the reinforcements it needed, and all Curtin's fine words about fighting to defend every corner of Australia were nothing more than words. So, isn't hindsight, facts and historical research a wonderful thing? as seen through the uh, the sea backroscope but at the time for the people who were actually operating the aircraft on reconnaissance in the southwest pacific they had a pretty good idea of how little australia had available for the defense of australia 
what nobody in Australia except Curtin was aware of was that the Americans on Hawaii had broken the Japanese naval codes to the point where Roosevelt was able to absolutely assure Churchill that there was no Japanese plans for invading Australia or of occupying Australia. What the Japanese wanted, their actual heart's desire was for what they called a greater Southeast Asian co-prosperity sphere with Japan at the center of the sphere and they visualized the bottom of their outermost defensive perimeter running through Timor, Ambon, Port Moresby and out to Guadalcanal. From there they wanted to go up through Wake and Midway to the Aleutian Islands from the Aleutians straight across to China then down through Manchuria or Manchuko or whatever they wanted to call it taking in French Indochina and Burma and they'd get India if they could get it to come on side and basically that was their idea of their western defensive perimeter and it wasn't till after the fall of Singapore the two Japanese Imperial Navy Lieutenant Commanders were given the task on a Friday afternoon of considering the idea of invading and occupying Australia because they'd gone like a hot knife through butter right through the British Empire and the Dutch East Indies. And the Americans in the South Pacific were pretty much bottled up and on the run in the Philippines. So that was their theory. Go and study it over the weekend, fellas. Well, they found that the Imperial Japanese Naval Marines were completely, absolutely, fully occupied defending islands all over the Southwest Pacific already. The Japanese Army was completely and utterly, totally bogged in China with designs on Burma. They found that the Japanese Merchant Marine didn't have any troop ships or supply ships to carry any forces with which to invade Australia. Um, neither the Imperial Japanese Army or the Imperial Japanese Naval Air Services had any aircraft to contribute to an invasion, but what they could do and what they did try to do and what they were not very successful in overall was they could capture and garrison islands and bases, naval bases and airfields right across their southern defensive perimeter and from those bases, they could then raid northern Queensland. Not a lot worth raiding there, but they could then raid Darwin and they could raid Broome. And by so doing, what they hoped to do was deny the US and Britain the use of Australia as a forward operating base with which to attempt to dare to attack the Imperial Japanese realm. Nobody who was up at the pointy end had any idea that Curtin and Churchill and Roosevelt were totally certain that the Japanese had no plans to invade Australia. Everybody thought that their grandmother's safety depended on them defending Australia from the Japanese who everybody assumed naturally wanted to invade because we knew we were defenseless. We knew why we were defenseless, we were pissed off, we were doing our level best to convert DC-3 engines and whir away wing, wings and tails into um, boomerangs. And we were trying to do our best, but yeah, we were pretty defenseless and we knew it and we were scared. And these are first person accounts of people who were there at the time. And some of their opinions are an exact encapsulation a time capsule, if you like, of what people thought at the time. Knowing better in 2020 hindsight doesn't take away anything at all from their courage, devotion, selflessness, um, and willingness to sacrifice themselves for the good of their mates because nobody wanted to be seen to have let their friends down, their colleagues, the people they trained with. So, yeah, they went out there and it was do or die time. And thanks to Jack Riddell for writing it all down before he died of old age.
So we've read eight pages. Belay that. We have read on to page eight. We've covered RAF flying boat squadrons. We've covered Catalina bases. We've covered the advanced operating base circuit. We are now at the war begins, which starts up near the beginning of page eight. And that's where we start there. On page eight. Civilians were shipped out of Rabaul on 22nd December by Neptunia and Malaita. Later arrivals from outlying stations were flown out by DC-3 aircraft on the 28th December. Neptuno was sunk at Darwin by a Japanese air raid on the 19th of February 1942. On New Year's Day 1942, the RAAF Flying Boat Squadrons and Headquarters HQ at Moresby comprised number 11 and number 20 squadron, totaling 863 men of all ranks. Moresby civilians were shipped out about mid-January. Six Catalinas set out on the 12th of January for the first raid on Japanese positions. Both squadrons took part with three aircraft staging through Manus and three aircraft staging through Cavine to attack Truck Naval Base in the Caroline Islands. So I make that Port Moresby to Manus to Truck Lagoon. And that was Australia's first bombing raid against the Japanese. 12 January 1942. Squadron leader TM Price had been prevented from locating the target because of extremely bad weather. A24-7 left Moresby at 02.35 hours for Manus arriving at 08.25. After a meal and refuelling they took off again at 16.20, returning to Rabaul at 10.35 the next day. The aircraft left at 12.15 after refuelling for home. Both flights were to meet over Emmerau Island, but the bad weather kept their paths independent. The same operation was repeated on 15 January. This time, Squadron Leader Price was assisted by Flight Lieutenant David Candle, Campbell, Headquarter Navigation Officer. Four aircraft reached the target. Only A2313, captained by Flight Lieutenant Beaumont, attacked. A24, captained by Flight Lieutenant Tom Davies, crashed on takeoff after a refueling stop at Caving. Lieutenant Hutchison in A249 landed to search for survivors. There were none. A2413 proceeded alone. Terry Deegan, second armourer air gunner, was replaced by Len Martin on A247 at Manus. Terry was to be picked up on the return trip from truck. Unfortunately, A247 could not get to Manus because of bad weather and diverted to Salamua for petrol instead. Terry Deegan came out with the commandos many weeks later, as after the Japanese took Rabaul on 22nd of January, Manus was then in Japanese-controlled territory. Although the cat raids by Catalunas on truck yielded very little in damage to the enemy, it certainly highlighted the need for navigators to be added to the crews, and flying at the heights of 10,000 feet or higher was not necessary. It only added to the extreme discomfort to all crews because of the low temperatures at this height. Subsequently, most Catalina bombing attacks were carried out at 5,000 feet because the enemy could not short fuse their high explosive AK, AK bracket AA or anti-aircraft at that height. The rest of the run of the mill small arms fire had almost run out of velocity at this height. On 21 January, A24-9, Captain Lieutenant Hutchison or Captain by Lieutenant Hutchison, was attacked by Japanese carrier fighter planes near Salamua, set on fire and crashed. Tom Keane, second armourer air gunner, used his parachute and landed safety, safely. To everyone's amazement, he walked back to Moresby 10 days after he was shot down. He was the only survivor. On the same day, A-24-8, Captain by Flight Lieutenant Bob Thompson, was patrolling off Kaving, sighted the Japanese invasion fleet. While attacking this force, A-24-8 was shot down and landed on fire on the water. During this action, three of the crew were killed. A-24-8 sank after the survivors abandoned ship. Five were picked up by a Japanese destroyer. They were taken to Tokyo and were recovered at the end of the war. Rabaul fell to the Japanese invaders on the 22nd of January. The Catalunas bombed Rabaul during the nights of the 22nd, 24th, 26th, 28th and 30th of January. 
On the 27th of January, Kaveen was bombed. The aircraft were captained by Squadron Leader T.M. Price, Flight Lieutenant T.E. Beaumont, Flight Lieutenant Hemsworth, Flight Lieutenant uh, Flying Officer Norman, Flying Officer Higgins, Flying Officer Dugan, Flying Officer Bolifo, and Squadron Leader Kingsland. On the day Rabal fell, A-24-7 with Captain Price was taking off from Moresby just on dusk when it crashed. After several hours of hard work by the crew and the marine section was put under tow very low in the water. The bottom had split with four feet of water in the engineers and bunks com bunk compartment. The damage was isolated by the bulkhead doors. Finally, the aircraft had beaching gear fitted and was put on the slipway. A-24-7 did not fly again as Japanese Zeros set fire to it at the moorings in Moresby Harbour on the 28th of February. Captain Dick Kingsland of A-24-1 on 13 January without a bomb load, flying extra reconnaissance, flew a photographic reconnaissance flight from Tulagi to around the Gilbert Islands, returning with 100 photographs. Meanwhile, A-24-5, Captain Alan Norman on 22nd of January was attacked on the water at Gavutu by a Mavis Japanese flying boat. He managed to have the engine started and after a lot of zigging and zagging on the water with the gunners manning the blister guns engaging the Mavis, supported by Australian Imperial Forces machine gun fire from the shore, finally took off and eluded the attacker. After repairs, the aircraft took off at 21.25 hours and was engaged in an all-night search of Rabal and Samarii area. It was waterborne at Moresby at 12.10 hours. A-24-5 was flown by Captain T.M. Price on 24 January and bombed enemy shipping at Rabaul Harbour with a round trip of 16 hours. Losses of aircraft and crews placed the two squadrons in a desperate situation. A-24-1 was taken off training at Rathmines and brought into operations while A-24-2, after a major overhaul, was expected back on strength by mid-February. Bebo Bebbington, an engineer, had Lady Luck on his side. He obtained a bottle of beer and took it on board the aircraft. During the night, he was pinged by the orderly officer and awarded one week in the guardhouse for punishment. But the RAAF had no guardhouse. Authorities moved the residents from a Kone Dobi tin hut into tents and proclaimed the hut the RAAF guardhouse. Punishment would not be complete without the offender being given work. Bebo was put in charge of the native assistants in the cookhouse. He had never eaten better since his arrival in Port Moresby. After 10 days detention instead of a week, the authorities were more than pleased to throw him out of jail. They let the original tenants back into their hut. Without the tent people complaining of their living conditions, Bebo may have occupied the hut for a much longer period. With the fall of Rabal to the Japanese on the 22nd of January, that there is Rabal, the remnants of number 24 squadron, Wirraways and Hudsons, together with the staff of the Catalina Advanced Operating Base, set out to walk over the mountains for a pre-arranged rendezvous at Sumsum with Sunderland flying boats. First arrivals of survivors were about 1700 hours on the 23rd of January. Shortly afterwards, two Sunderlands, captained by Flight Lieutenant Len Gray and Flight Lieutenant Mike Mather, also arrived. They left Moresby on the 22nd of January to go to Rabaul to evacuate these people. Advised the Japanese were landing at Rabaul at the time they landed at Sam Samarai, staying the night. By 1920 hours, the loading was complete with 50 men on Len Gray's aircraft and 48 with Mike Mather. All superfluous equipment, such as rifles and webbing, was dumped overboard to lessen the weight. Both aircraft landed at Samarai th some three hours later, where Captain Dick Kingsland and co-pilot Bob Hurst in Catalina A2410 had arrived during the afternoon. The Catalina crew set down a flare path for the night landing of the Sunderlands. The next day, 24 January, Len Gray returned to Toll in the late afternoon and collected another 25 RAAF, 24 Australian Imperial Forces and civilians, taking them back to Samarai. There, all evacuees had showers and were given clothing from steamships store. 
The last load was taken out by Cataluna to Moresby and the others direct to Townsville by the Sunderlands. The survivors in the steamship store clothing look more like successful planters rather than rescued servicemen. The flare path under the supervision of Dick Kingsland was set down by Jack Dewhurst, Vic Knowles and Vince Kavanagh from A2410 crew. It was not easy as there was a swift current with a smooth sea and little wind. A rowboat was used as no power boats were available. When the Sunderlands arrived, they anchored close to shore. The rowboat assisted in getting the survivors ashore. The survivors were clad only in shorts. Wet, cold, hungry, thirsty, confused, some airsick, some like so many scared small children. Some even crying and doubtless many will remember these aircraft and crews forever and tell the story to their grandchildren. Ashore, they were sorted in groups of able-bodied and not so able and spent the night ashore with the handful of Australian Imperial forces still at Samarai. A2410 and the two Sunderlands were riding at anchor with crews aboard that night. Mick Casamatti, engineer on Mike Mather's aircraft, dropped a lead, uh, lead line out of the forward hatch and tied the loose end of it to a kero tin up on the flight deck. That's a kerosene tin. If the aircraft dragged its anchor, down came the tin to wake the crew. All was well until Mike Mather and his co-pilot returned to the aircraft. As they came alongside, they grabbed the dangling lead line, bringing down the caro tin. Up jumped Casimati, screaming, We're adrift! Start the donks! Donkey engine was a term used back in the 1930s for any engine, as against having a donkey walking in circles around a windlass to operate a winch. Doing the donkey work. Uh, this noise at 0200 hours in the morning was startling, waking the crews who thought the two Sunderlands had collided. This was the night of the 23rd of January 1942 at Samarai, and while the commotion was afoot, the Japanese were occupying Rabaul. Next morning, A2410 took 35 able-bodied men to Port Moresby, and the remainder were taken to Townsville by the two Sunderlands. A2410 returned to Samarai the same afternoon and stayed overnight, and again put down the flare path for Len Gray, who had flown directly to Toll Plantation, then landed at Keeper and collected another load of survivors, being 25 RAAF and 24 AIF. After Gray had landed, the flare path was taken up. Next morning, Gray returned to Townsville and Dick Kingsland returned to Moresby with some of the RAF staff from the advanced operating base. When the decision was made for the RAAF to be evacuated from Rabaul, Three wireless telegraphers, Ted Sturvant, Bob Young, Bob Brennan, with electrician Keith Gowans, all from the advanced operating base, decided to attempt to take the RAAF crash boat back to Moresby. They loaded up many drums of fuel and an RAAF wireless transmitter, setting off from Rabaul on the evening of 22nd of January. They ran aground on Raturnai Reef just outside Rabaul Harbour. They were rescued by John Gilmore, Harry Carr, Bert Goss in and Bert Goss in Gilmore's pinnace. They were on the way out of Rabaul Harbour and returning to his plantation at Putt-Putt. When Ted Sturbison heard the engine from the pinnace, he sent an SOS signal with his torch. Gilmore spotted the signal. After heaving a line aboard and making it past both ends, the four RAAF men came along hand over hand with their bodies in the water. Other advanced operating base staff included Arthur Reeves, Storman, Tossa Bryan, Tony Lawrence, both from the Marine section, wireless telegrapher Tor John Jenkin, wireless telegrapher Ray Rees, wireless telegrapher Sam Gorman, wireless telegrapher Matt Bridgman. Ray Rees also escaped from the advanced operating base and he was posted to Tulagi, RAAF base in April, just in time to join in yet another escape. February 1942 operations. On 1 February, bombing attacks by the Catalunas continued on Rabaul. By 3 February, they were being opposed by night fighters. A23, A24-3, Captain Flight Lieutenant Tubby Higgins was attacked. Harry Foster, second wireless telegrapher, was wounded in the ankle. A24-5, Captain by Jeff Hemsworth, was hit by zeros. The engine and fuel systems were damaged to such an extent that after breaking off the action, the port propeller was feathered. They proceeded to Salamua, where a night landing was made in the dark. I guess against a moonlight, when a night landing might be fairly bright. At first light, the crew made running repairs, which enabled the aircraft to take off and follow the coast around to Moresby via Milne Bay. 
Americans call it Milne, Australians call it Milne. During the action over at the target, armourer gunner Doug Dick, firing from the port blister, shot down a Zero, the first to fall to the RAAF in the area. First engineer Bobby Cox's log sheet states, quote, over target, located by searchlights, attacked by three enemy fighters, port engine disabled, air screw feathered, oil and petrol tanks badly holed, one enemy fighter shot down by a blister gunner, landed Salamua, patched oil and fuel tanks, unquote. On the evening of 3 February, Japanese flying boats bombed Port Moresby. Although no great damage was done, it set the stage for future living conditions for the men in Tin City at Coney Dobe. The residents now left the camp after dark and opted to stay in the bush for the night so that if the barracks were bombed, they would be safe. Crew members had to be on call so they could not do this. They stayed in their huts except when they guarded the aircraft, two men each night on the moorings. Many plans were made in the event of a Japanese invasion. Troops would move off to the west of Moresby and make their way back to Australia through a chain of the, the chain of islands to the Gulf of Carpentaria. Many troops had their rations packed and ready to go if necessary, as having knowledge of how our troops had been left at Rabaul and the general, the general feeling was around that it could also happen at Moresby. Although the army had installed guns on Parga Hill, Moresby, they were not used until the Japs started the second week of air raids. It was reported that the army was waiting for the concrete foundations to cure. When they finally commenced firing during a daylight raid, the cheers from the slit trenches were loud and long. The gunners were delighted when they brought down the first Japanese bomber. By this time, the Catalina crews were feeling the strain. A visit by the Minister for Air resulted in the announcement that all crews would have their deferred pay commence on 7 November instead of 7 December. They were also to be credited with three days leave per month. Catalina crews did not think much of this, as many of them would not be around to enjoy it. They would have rather more aircraft, more crews, more anti-aircraft guns, and some fighter planes. By 9 February, the enemy kept up the pressure by making a landing at Gasmata, toward the southwest coast of New Britain. A combined raid by Catalinas and Lockheed Hudsons was carried out that night, but nil results were observed. On 15 February, A-24-2, which had been overhauled at Rathmines, arrived in Port Moresby and the crew of A-24-7 came back into operations and stayed with this aircraft until it went to Rathmines for repairs on the 27th of March. Captain Hoot Gibson flew A-24-2 on the 16th of February on an eight-hour reconnaissance out of Port Moresby with nil sightings. On 19 February, Captain Keith Bolifo left Moresby at 1600 hours bombed Rabaul and returned to base at 0600 hours on the next day. Similar operations were carried out on 22 and 24 February. A24-13, captained by Flight Lieutenant E. Beaumont, took part in these raids but did not return on 24 February. Captain and crew presumed lost. On 26 February, A24-2, captained by Squadron Leader Dick Kingsland, proceeded to Rabaul and dive-bombed the wharfs and surrounds with highly satisfactory results. After the surviving attack, the aircraft came back over the harbour and dropped a 500,000 candle power flare. It lit up the whole harbour and some 50 vessels of all types of carriers, submarines, cruiser destroyers and transport. Dick Kingsland gave an immediate plain language report which led to a daylight raid by units of the US Army Air Force the next morning. On returning to Moresby at 0430 hours on the 27th of February, the crews were met on the wharf by squadron leader Frank Chapman, who asked them to go out again that night for an urgent supply drop. Setting off at 17.30 hours, it set course for Coast Watchers Kyle and Benham on New Ireland. After satis a satisfactory operation, it went on to bomb Rabaul. A24-2 was in need of repairs, including bullet and shrapnel holes under the waterline. The engineer had made arrangements to have it slipped on arrival back at Moresby. By 0700, it was on the slipway and work commenced. A24-3 and A24-6 were on moorings adjacent to the slipway, and A24-7 was on a mooring near Hannah Border. At about 10 hours, six zeros came through the heads of, at Moresby almost at sea level. After testing their guns on the Moresby wreck at the reef, lined up on the moored Catalinas. All were set on fire. 
A24-3 and A24-6 sank at their moorings. Airmen were working on them. George Nan Caro, electrician, was killed. Barney Ross, fitter, was creased by a bullet. A little higher would have resulted in a voice change. Fortunately, the RAAF had provided machine gun cover over the slipway area, manned by the orderly room staff. From a gun position dug into the hill behind the area, Jim Preston and his mates did a good job protecting A24-2. At the end of this attack on 28 February, the only two Catalunas left on strength were A24-2 and A24-10. Work continued around the clock on A24-2. By 11 hours on 1 March, was ready to get, go back into the water. Yeah, punctuation error back there. At this stage, squadron leader Frank Chapman arrived and advised that there was a yellow alert, bracket, the Japs were coming, close bracket. The crew helped to push A-24-2 into the water. The beaching gear was removed, the engines were started, the air aircraft climbed to 20 feet, swung out the blister guns and headed for Thursday Island. On arrival at the island, a radio watch was arranged through the Royal Australian Navy, who had a small base there. The crew set to making a mooring. After looking around the wharf area and locating the blacksmith shop in a large concrete block, a suitable mooring was made and the aircraft changed from its own anchor to the safety of a good mooring. Some very good news on the 27th of February. A2410, captained by Keith Bolitho, was dispatched to Samarai to collect a total of 21 survivors. Many AIF, who had travelled by launches Maria and Eulalie from Awal on New Britain, they camped overnight in Samarai cottages. This was 36 days after the Japanese capture of Rabaul, and these survivors had been on the move most of the time. The Maria was handed over to a native crew for return to the owner, Father Culhane, of Awful Mission, uh, uh, Wool Mission. Conditioned response, I was reading that as awful mission. Army launch mascot was used to take these troops to go aboard A2410 for return to Moresby. These were the first army survivors to come out of Rabaul, apart from the RAAF people who'd been rescued by flying boats. March to April 1942 operations. On 8th of March, A2417, Captain Alan Norman took off from Moresby at 0500 hours and sighted, reported, and shadowed the Japanese invasion fleet headed for Ley and Salamua. This fleet was bombed later that afternoon by Hudson's of number 32 squadron and reported a direct hit on one transport, but the enemy successfully completed the landing. On 14 March, A2418, Captain Terry Dugan left Moresby late at night for rat mines. This aircraft early in March had been severely damaged at the moorings by a Japanese bomb and had been towed to Fairfax Harbour and camouflaged. The tail and rudder sections from A24-7 had been used to make temporary repairs. Wilbur Watson, Sergeant 2nd Armourer, organised... Second... Ooh, OK. Sergeant 2A, Airman 2nd Class? Yeah, I guess. Wilbur Watson... Sergeant Airman 2nd Class organised this repair. Although during the course of repairs, the enemy bombed Moresby on three occasions, they did not locate the hidden aircraft. By 8 March, the Japanese had landed at Salamua and Ley. The American carrier force made a surprise raid on these locations from their position in the Gulf of Papua. On 10th of March, 108 American aircraft were dispatched through the gap in the Owen Stanley Ranges. Only one aircraft was to be lost. The American commander stayed at the gap to control the traffic. If anybody isn't quite aware, the Owen Stanley Ranges, there's a massive range of mountains up there. Gulf of Puppy was here where the aircraft carriers are. They're headed for, they're not going to show us where Lay is. Wewax up there, I think Lay. Lays somewhere on that coast as well. But yeah, from here, over the mountains, bomb, lay in Salamua, and then back. And only lose one. That was really, really unusual for the Americans, particularly at that stage of the war. When my impression is that they were sort of rushing inexperienced crews through their training system, sending them out to Australia and hoping they wouldn't get lost. 
As the aircraft attack was underway, a naval force consisting of HMAS Hobart, HMAS Australia, the USS Chicago, and some destroyers had positioned themselves on the western side of the Jombard Passage to protect the carrier force from any seaborne Japanese intervention. Okay. Two Australians, one American. During this period, the American destroyers USS Louisville and USS Astoria had lost five SOC float planes. The American float plane crews included pilots Ensign William L. William J. McGovern, Lu Lieutenant J. M. Brandt, Ensign Leyland L. Wilder, John H. Gra John H. Graves, and Joseph B. Young. The radio men were Miller, Horn, Lucas, Hulagard, and Owen. A-24-2 was moved from Thursday Island to Tulagi on the 6th of March. When the Air American fleet returned to Noumea, they asked the RAAF to search for the planes and their crews. After over a week of searching on the 18th of March, A-24-2 came upon five float planes on the beach at Rossell Island. Frank Chapman landed in the lagoon to assess the situation. The area where the float planes landed was near the Osborne family house. They had moved in January, but had left instructions with their employees to assist any airmen who became stranded. The Americans wanted to burn their aircraft and go back to Tulagi on A-24-2. The Australians convinced them that a working party could be brought from Moresby to repair the aircraft. The radio men were taken to Tulagi and a working party arrived the next day from Moresby on A24-14 with pilot officer Keith Bolifio and A24-2 arrived from Tulagi at the same time. A24-2 swung out its guns and flew as top cover while A24-14 was on the water. Wilbur Watson and Brian Walters was in, were in charge of the RAAF working party. The Americans taken to Tulagi had run out of cigarettes and coffee. The crew of A24-2 shared theirs, but soon tobacco ran out for everybody. Duties for the A24-2 included landings on Rossell Island on 19th and 20th of March, with a seaward reconnaissance on the 21st of March. The aircraft was on a dispersal from Tulagi on a daily basis to Guadalcanal on each day from the 22nd to the 27th of March. On the 27th of March, A24-2 proceeded to Moresby via Rossell Island taking back the American float plane radio men from the RAAF base at Gavutu to the float planes. The float planes left Russell Island on the 28th of March and flew out to the USS Curtis, bracket a PBY servicing ship. The first four were taken aboard. The fifth, already badly damaged, was accidentally knocked against the ship's stern, suffering more damage. It was abandoned overboard. A few days later, Rolf Cambridge from Sorakin Plantation arrived at Gavutu on his own boat. He was promised passage to Moresby when A24-2 arrived. Upon arrival in Moresby, Commanding Officer Squadron Leader T.M. Price directed A24-2 to proceed at Rathmines the same night. Rolf Cambridge was now a VIP and his information was required by the authorities. At this stage, Arthur Sandell, a navigator, joined the crew and did the navigation to Rathmines. Leaving Moresby at 19.25 hours and arriving at 08.15 the next day. Another navigator, John Moline, was given passage to Rathmines to meet up with his assigned crew. A24-2 was due to be overhauled. The crew was sent on leave. For some of them, it was the first leave in eight months. A24-17, captained by Alan Norman, was caught on the moorings at Gavutu on the 20th of March and badly damaged by bombs from a Japanese Mavis flying boat. It was towed to a mangrove creek and found later the same later in the day by another Mavis and damaged further. It received structural damage to the main struts, port main plane, batteries blown out of storage and main circuits destroyed. The crew made temporary repairs but needed to hand start both engines and hand wind both floats and then make a 17 hour trip to Rathmines for repairs. On 21 March, Kitty Hawks from number 17 squadrons commenced arriving in Moresby. Until then, they'd been called the Tomorrow Hawks and the Never Never Hawks. Ah, oh, yes, look, it's even mentioned here. 
Their arrival had been awaited for weeks and they were referred to as the Tomorrow Hawks and later the Never Hawks. When they arrived, they were fired on when landing because no one had told the aerodrome defence people. Communication breakdown. They went into action the same day, shooting down a Japanese bomber. By the end of March, A24-16, captained by Flight Lieutenant C.F. Thompson, was operating from Tulagi against new Japanese landings at Faisi. They had also occupied Buka and Kaita. Just over a week later, Buen and Manus were occupied. The risk was too great to have Catalunas in Moresby in daylight. The month of April saw most activity centred around Gavutu, from where the RAAF was attacking Japanese positions. By 11 April, Flight Lieutenant Thompson had handed over A2416 to Pilot Officer Belutho. The same day, A2418, captained by Flying uh, Pilot Officer Alan Norman, attacked Faisi. On 26 April, A2423, captained by Flight Lieutenant Edkins, Ekins and A2414, now captained by Flight Lieutenant Bob Hurst, attacked Faisi, and again on the 27th of April. On 26 April, A2423, captained by Flight Lieutenant Eakins, A2414, now captained by Flight Lieutenant Bob Hurst, attacked Faisi, and again on 27 April. A2419, captained by Flying Officer Eric Townsend, joined them only two day, after only two days on Gavutu. A24-5 had been damaged by Japanese on the 3rd of February, was caught on the moorings at Port Moresby on the 23rd of April and destroyed by zeros. On Anzac Day, 25th of April, Moresby had its 32nd air raid. The Catalina crews knew that before the Japanese could mount any naval attack on Moresby, they would need to occupy Tulagi. It was agreed that if this happened, the Americans would at the worst allow them to construct an airstrip at Guadalcanal and then move to dispossess them. On 20th of April, a new commanding officer arrived at Gavutu. Flying Officer P. Gum was to play a leading part in the evacuation of his new command within the next 12 days. On the next day, Sir Charles Burnett, Chief of Staff, arrived by Catalina to inspect the base. After staying the night, he travelled to Sydney via Vila. And... We'll just read that last couple of paragraphs. How's that for high techery? Catalina's on the Coral Sea Battle. 1 May 1942 was the day the, the Coral Sea battle commenced for the RAAF. Operations over the next eight days would cost the lives of two crews, the loss of three aircraft, and two others needing repairs. In 1987, the writer obtained from David Vincent, the author of Catalina Chronicle, a copy of the Royal Australian Air Force, Netherlands East, uh, RAAF NEA. Northeast Australia, unit history sheet for aircraft movements during the Coral Sea Battle, amended and corrected copies of this document follow. The following pages contain lists of each aircraft and details of the duty of Catal each Catalina for their daily operations. On 1 May, A2417 located a Japanese task force of five ships, which was the Tulagi invasion force. A2414 in in intercepted two ships on the 2nd of May, bombing them without result. These ships were among those attacked by American carrier planes on the 4th of May at Guadalcanal. And just a bit of a sneak of a preview. The next video in this series, uh, Coral Sea Battle Unit History Sheet. Details of operations, RAAF Station Port Moresby, numbers 11 and 20 squadrons. We actually have a day-by-day -day breakdown. And then there's a postscript, and the postscript will be a subsequent video with personal diaries and letters of crews with hand-drawn charts. So, yeah, there's at least two more videos in this series to go.
And bear in mind, I'm really only planning on covering to the end of the Coral Sea battle. So, yeah, there's going to be a few of these uh, sea bacroscopic videos. Because, you know, sort of, kind of, if somebody like me doesn't make the video, who the, hell's hell, who the hell else is going to do so? Hmm? Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.